It's member-supported Hawaii Public Radio, all things considered, and I'm Dave Lawrence. It is a fun time we've been having here this evening. I've got a gifted vocalist, guitarist, uh, it says keyboardist too in, in his lineage, and does a little keyboard, making sure I'm not telling fibs here. <laughs> Veteran of Honey Tribe, Royal Southern Brotherhood, he's through Friday at the Blue Note. It is uh, Devin Almond taking a few moments for us on All Things Considered. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, you're quite welcome, man. Uh, give folks an idea of the show that you're doing here in town in, in terms of what songs you're going to be playing. Kind of describe the set for newcomers who are going to hear you on the radio and are just curious, well, what's it all about? Uh, I mean, you know, I've I've kind of been out on the uh, like the blues blues rock scene for like ten years. I uh, got about eight records out. Uh, it's really kind of a trip through my career, you know. So we we play like a little something something off every record. Uh, have a new record out that come uh, come out October called Ride or Die, and uh, uh, luckily it came out number one on the Billboard Blues charts. Uh, it was my first number one ever. Uh, Great cover of that. Thank you. And, you know, just uh, playing some songs from that and then songs throughout, you know, my career. Um, it's, it's a high energy uh, audience involved show. It's a lot of fun. And one of the things he drops in there are some just tasty covers, spinners. I mean, just caught me off guard. And, and I know you're a soulful brother because I was doing my homework on you, but that really uh, that wrapped up the set in a nice way. Songs like that are the kind of thing you welcome. That's the kind of nostalgic song. Those are kind of tearjerkers because we all have some kind of connection to them. And those are, it's almost like a Santana song in that it, it just touches you on that emotional level. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the Spinners, I mean, no one had ever covered that song that, that I knew of. So um, I was writing for that record a couple years ago, uh, Ragged and Dirty. And I was, uh, I rented a, a little chalet uh, in the Alps and uh to to write the record and i, I really hit a wall like I, I i hit a bit of a writer's block and i turned pandora on and uh the spinners all be around came on and i was like i have to do this so like i love this song it's like right in my wheelhouse so like it's it's been a like a, a staple in the set for for years so. it's a feel-good song you hear that it's kind of like just uh I, I lost my mom in 2013 for me i hear that song i can feel her reaching out to me and i know you lost yours too god bless you on that thank you so much yeah 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 uh, my mom passed a few months ago and i took a little bit of time off from touring to just kind of like regroup and, and and process and 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 just kind of come out the other side knowing that the audience um, that we play for, thankfully, um, really pulls me through. Yeah, you are amazing to have the composure you had a few months after my mom left. I, I mean, a few years now, it's been four years, and I, I don't have the composure you've got, so you're doing really good. And, and um, I, was, I couldn't help but notice on the stage, speaking of the, the, uh, the vibe of, of powerful forces in our lives, the guitar strap that you're using uh, and I could be wrong, forgive me if I have it wrong, but I was looking at, uh, and great, thank you for the video, that's really cool of you to do. Um, this guitar strap, uh, I'm hoping, I'm, not, I'm going out on a limb here, that looks like it's a, a very familiar one to me if, if you're a fan of yeah. the brothers from well, way back when. A lot of people, you know, know the, the look of this strap as, as being obviously like Dwayne Allman's uh, guitar strap, <clears throat> which of course, it, it, you know, he's the guy that like made it popular um but in actuality like this is not Dwayne's. um the the guy that that, that made Dwayne's called me and said i made him a backup strap like 30 years ago would, would you like it and i go uh yeah well yes i would um so i've I played with this strap my whole career and um i've actually made it available to my fans and um you know, we've done a bit of uh, business, like just kind of recreating it and making it available to people. So, um, you know, it's it's a special kind of iconic uh, piece of music history. So it's cool. It's great to see it on you. It's great to see you walking around after the show with it too, keeping it close by. <laughs> I, I really don't want. You know, I get done with the show, and it's like it's like I don't want it to grow legs. So yeah. Good for you, man. You got to protect what you love. And uh, you mentioned the word iconic. I was looking at some of the influences you've got and thinking about some of the ones, some of my favorite bands. And I thought, wow, it looks like Devin and I might have had the very, uh, our very favorite band when we were both little kids. And I don't see like the seven inch platform boots, but I'm thinking. 
You know, it was really crazy. Um, I, I think it was 77, and I was five. And I, the craziest shit is that I can remember that. Uh, but my mom started dating a, a radio DJ. And, like, he came over, and, like, we hung out. And I had, like, Beatles records and Wings records. And he was like, you got to check this out. <laughs> and he slid me a vinyl copy. No bullshit. 77 vinyl copy of dress to kill oh wow and i looked at it and i was five years old it was like these dudes in suits but with this like kabuki makeup and i was like wait like i i i at a young age i understood like the whole irony of three-piece wall street suits with kabuki makeup and i was like and the hair yeah and the hair and like the hair i was like i like this a lot this is <laughs> fucked up uh this but but it, ta- it like speaks to me um yeah man you know and then i don't know what movie it was that i heard uh wanna rock and roll all night and i was like yeah all right sign me up you know um so kiss I think Kiss for a lot of like, how old are you? I'm 46. All right, 44. So Kiss for our age group. Now that we're here, we are right. We're in our mid 40s. You know, Kiss at that time. Our Beatles. And and we have to say in the in the cinematic sense, Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Like we came up in the 70s, we saw Kiss and Star Wars. Like from a from a musical standpoint and a cinematic standpoint. No one had ever seen anything like Kiss. No one had ever seen anything like Star Wars. And especially if you're a little kid, which we were, yeah. and your first musical shit was like Kiss, and your first movie was like Star Wars, <laughs> every everything was just screwed from that. Like Because they really set the bar so high in entertainment value. And, and really, like I think that's what it's about, man. People want to be entertained. They want to come to a show. They want to come to a movie. They want to turn off the world and get lost. And that's what I've tried to do on my show. It's just, you know what? You're with me now. You're with me for an hour and a half. Forget everything. Let's go. And you show it on stage. He's walking on tables at the Blue Note. He's uh, performing in a kind of visual way that if you're a fan of old school rock bands like Kiss or, or uh, any band from the that period but you're right it was a certain kind of band that did that kind of that had the showmanship that you're talking about but a quick point they had such great music on those first records especially dress to kill but all of the original kiss records are highly oh. overlooked because i think sure. of the yeah. of their look their music got overlooked and it, but it but it really wasn't like you can't sit there and even as fans and say that their musicianship was amazing right. it, it wasn't that it was lacking it's it's that the 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 hooks the presentation you know like i mean it, it was just a vibe it was a vibe like you came to the show the lights went down love gun detroit rock city you know so it, they weren't like killing it with licks but they were killing you with the vibe the presence you know and 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 the thunder the thunder that they brought and and there's a lot of art to that that is very legit so. Oh, totally. Um, I mean, rock and roll over. That album is going to stand the test of time. I don't care what anybody says of the rest of my life. I'll, I'll listen. Love them and leave them. The guitar solo Ace does in that oh, thing. Dude, yeah. <laughs> come on, Ace Frehley. Like, come on. So, uh, a little bit about your career that was uh, something that you've, you've crossed paths with a lot of people, and you've been blessed uh, because of, because of who you are. And uh, one of the cats that. Um, Cyril Neville uh, has been part of your life. Explain that and the uh, Royal Southern Brotherhood. How'd you hook up with him? Um, it was crazy because uh, I ended up with the same manager as Cyril. And, and he hit me like two weeks after I hired him. And uh, he goes, hey, man, what do you think about uh, making a band with Cyril Neville? I'm like, no. What, well, why would like I hired you? To like take this uh, this band that I'm in, you know, further and uh, but once I thought about it, I really thought that uh, music lovers would would love mm-hmm. a little Neville and a little Almond in the same band and and we did it and we did it for three years. It was successful. We went like all over the world like three times and and made three records and it was really one of the best times of my life. 
You've gotten into a lot of cool things. When you did the uh, Javier Vargas's project, Love, Union, and Peace, did you get to actually meet Jack Bruce, or was he just doing his own thing on that? No, no, no. I never met Jack. Um, Because he's on that, right? He did his own. Yeah, we're we're on the same record, but... uh, no, he. I think he pulled those sessions up in like England, like did his parts, and you know it was it was, it was just one of those records where like everybody kind of chimed in from different parts of the world and and just made the record for Javier. So technology taking the good stories out of a uh, session. Yeah, right. <laughs> We're not all in the same room, so it, it was fun though. Um, similarly, I was uh, I was taking a look at your your social media account. It's just a great way to learn things about you. You and Bruce Willis. Where was that picture taken? What was that all about? That was uh, Cornell Dupree's birthday uh, right before he passed away. Uh, he had a birthday party at the uh, at BB King's in New York City, mm-hmm. and I think it was oh uh, six seven something like that. And um, Cornell Dupree had like so many special guests, and some of the guests were uh, were my dad and Bruce Willis and me, and we went on stage all three of us, and and like pl- like blew through like two blues numbers and just had had a blast. It was it was really cool. That's very cool. Uh, and I can tell from your uh, Twitter, you're an old school Rush fan. Because twenty one twelve was one of my great ones too. As as a child, we with lots of E's are the priests of the temples with lots of S's of Syrian. Well, I mean, you know, the the great thing about like having an iPhone for an, for an artist is is you know you can actually really kind of dive into your fan base. You know, like on Facebook, I think I, I don't know. It's it's not insane. But I think I'm up to like 130 grand, like in in followers or whatever. So I really like to engage them, and I like them to know like what's on my mind. And uh, it can be anything from a, a Facebook Live performance of one of my shows mm-hmm. to a picture of me and my son as birthday party um, to like a album cover of an album I'm like rediscovering. Right. Um, Bunch of cassettes that you dig. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the whole cassette thing really got out of hand. It was crazy because. Um, I realized that um, backstage, like before a show, when I would get pumped up, like the whole phone to the MP3 thing was just, it, it, I don't know, it just didn't have the depth, it didn't have the, 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 the sauce. So I actually went on eBay and got like a, like a cassette boombox, and then I started buying cassettes, and then all these fans hit me up and they're like, I got 50 cassettes, I'm going to send them to you. Give me, you know, and all of a sudden I turn around and I have like, 700 cassette tapes but man like the the analog vibe of them you know it's tape brother it it is man i so but my whole my whole my whole like mo on that was that i can't take you know a, a vinyl record player on tour and like get backstage and like put on a record like at home all i play is vinyl records but on tour it was like I could play cassettes. It's convenient. It would be better than MP3s. It would be fatter, juicier, warmer, you know, warmer analog. And so all of a sudden I look down, I have all these cassettes and uh, thank you guys <laughs> for sending me cassettes. But uh, it's good. I, I think I have to play a show now. So do we have one more? Yep. One more question. Then we'll yeah. let you go. Um, I first met your pop in New Orleans. It was Jazz Fest 94. And then just a few months later, right after Woodstock, I was hanging with him burning one on the bus in maine explain the interesting story of first making a connection with him yourself and share a story of your relationship that just you like that makes you feel good that makes you feel warm and fuzzy and just makes you makes you set for your next set i mean you know it's 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 a weird life you know when when you're born like the son of a rock star uh but you but you have no connection you know, uh, the connection came later in life. And it, I'm really grateful for that, actually, because, you know, when I was a kid, he was in, you know, involved in things that were in no way uh, cool. appropriate for a child. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, as we know, man, like, obviously, you know, I'm a father now. And, and uh, you know, my son's 17 years old. And you know, um, I'm, I'm really glad that I wasn't exposed to that side of it. 
But I'm also really glad that later in life, I got a chance to like reconnect with him and really have a good bond with him. So without diving in too much, you know, because that's not about my path or my world or my records, my discography. Um, but I'm, I'm just really grateful that we finally came together. We came together in peace. There was no bullshit. There was no bad blood. And we started making, you know, music together. We, I think we played on stage probably a hundred times together. Um, you know, and I love my dad and I respect my dad. Um, it, it's just one of those things, you know, where you'll never get that lost time, but you can always like make up, you know, and, and a lot of the music really had its way of, of, of making up for the lost time. So I dig Thanks that. It's Devin Allman here with us on all things considered. Thank you, my brother. Thank you.